Hypermasculinity could be described as bros that could have used a hug. Men, men don't get hugs un- unless they are bear hugs. Men can hug when it's culturally appropriated from another animal and can kill. Hypermasculinity is described as a psychological condition for the exaggerations of male stereotypes. These stereotypes have been contributed to so many issues that we've seen, and now we are confronting them in society. The stereotypes of hypermasculinity can lead to limiting definitions of what a man is. One influence is the American hypermasculine ideal, which is wholly very toxic and unbalanced in how it, our boys become men. On the opposite side of this ideal is an anti-masculinity, a man that grows up to be open-minded, well-spoken, intelligent, and generally a very balanced whole view of the world. Within the context of hypermasculinity, men are providers, protectors, and procreators. So what's driving it? I think it's our take on what it is to be a man. So our traditional view of masculinity holds that men should be, among other things, providers, protectors and procreators, with guiding behaviours like aggression, competitiveness and toughness and risk-taking as, as, as guiding behaviours that, that form a metaphorical map with which we walk through manhood or navigate through manhood. So that basically means jobs, guns and fucking. Combine all three and you are the top dog alpha male. So that basically means the gun-toting male prostitutes are the alphaist of all the alpha males. The ones that the legends of hypermasculinity speak of. The ones that movies like Rambo and Die Hard have tried so hard to emulate. For that matter, it restricts and limits the definitions of what a woman can be. With restrictive definitions of what a man is, it ensures what a man isn't. Men cannot show emotions of love or grief or fear. Those are reserved for females. You know, but they, they can hug without killing, but if a female hugs a man, She is also risking her life because of that earlier restrictive killer hug rule we talked about. Things are even restrictive in what men and women can wear. Joan of Arc is a prime example of those restrictive ideologies in full effect. Joan of Arc was a French hero. She was thought to be a prophetic figure that was supposed to bring glory to France in the early 1400s and the coronation of King Charles. This makes total sense. French crowns are very decadent and shiny with their jewels and their gold. So the coronation of a real man can only come from a woman's love of shiny shit since that was the common thought of the day. It, it's either that or uh, or a monkey could, could do it because they also like shiny shit. But, you know, monkeys don't live in France. It's, uh, it's way too turbulent for monkeys. Despite the challenges of gender stereotypes of the day, Joan of Arc was confident that she would lead the French to victory because she had spoken to the Lord and they said it was totally cool. She also cut her hair and dressed like a man in the heat of battle. And when she was executed, she was accused of heresy and witchcraft and dressing like a man, along with 70 other things. Now, the heresy and the witchcraft was because she claimed that she could talk to God. And at that point in human history, the belief was that women's ears, they were were just too weak to hear the voice of God. You know, a big booming ethereal figure speaking to the dainty, soft ears of a woman was sure to destroy her and just leave two smoldering breasts in the wake. The fact that dressing like a man was a crime is kind of peculiar. 
In fact, it was declining those allegations that signed her death warrant. She denounced her divinity, effectively breaking up with God. I mean, God, God took it pretty hard and hasn't been seen since. But she wouldn't denounce the clothing. The English wouldn't have it because, because they wear the pants in this authoritarian, imperialist, globalist domination. So they burned her at, at the stake, which I doubt God would have been happy about. Now, I think Joan of Arc was trying to spare the egos of these men, right? If, if the English soldiers were beaten by a warrior in a frilly dress and a corset and a gorgeous pony with bows in her hair, they would have probably gone insane. Women were considered to be these fragile bringers of life, and they needed to be protected. So when that life makes it out into the world, men can destroy it. And usually these are men that are you know, all about preserving and protecting the sanctity of life so they can destroy it. Hence our society's current obsession with never-ending war. But the egos of hypermasculinity are so fragile that in order to preserve their stereotypical roles, they had to make sure that she was killed. 